Behind me here is a whole schwack load of fertilizer. Seriously, every possible kind you could think of. And we're gonna go through exactly how you apply each one of these, whether it's to seeds, transplants, or containers, also including both organic, conventional fertilizers, and if you wanna do kind of a two for one, organic, synthetic, hybrid. Geek crew, we need a name for it. Sikena, orga synthetic? Orgosythenic? Is that, I don't know, is that it? Okay, so this video has been requested for a while now and I've decided we are gonna do a video on how to actually apply fertilizers, organic and synthetics, and then a separate video on the difference between organics and synthetics and what it does to your soil and all that fun stuff because otherwise the video would just be too big. While the ladies and men like big, um, sometimes video length can be an issue. So first off, when we're looking at fertilizers, we have a ton of different options. If we are going with synthetic, you could use a slow release granular. This is shaken flu, feed flu. <laughs> Who knows, it might give me the flu. All this is, is a slow release granular fertilizer. Over time, as microbes and water and mechanical degradation takes place. That is option number one for synthetic. Option number two for synthetic is a granular or liquid. Two of the same. This one dissolves actual water and looks like blue Kool-Aid and I trust it completely. Briskies! <laughs> I mean, it's good. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Well, well. I'm so confident in how safe synthetic <laughs> gets me this for this reason. And this is what I use over liquid because why would I pay for water when I can just literally get a whole bunch of blue Kool-Aid in a container? Now my opinion on synthetics in general, if you don't wanna watch the next video, is that I find them harmless. They are not gonna hurt you. If they're used responsibly, they're not gonna hurt your animals, they're not gonna hurt your kids, they're not gonna hurt the environment, and they're not gonna even hurt the soil. I may be biased. My background is in soil science. I've worked in laboratory and R&D situations in fertilizer industries. My family farms. Take that for what it is. I could be completely wrong. Next option is going to be organics. Now organics can come in a plethora of different versions as well. They can come in liquid. They can come in a slow release as well. It is just a bunch of different components kind of amalgamated together. And then you have something like a compost, for example, which has some nutrients, but then obviously some soil building properties to it as well. And then you have individual component versions. So blood meal, crushed eggs, whatever the case is. And these obviously are a hybrid between a compost or a manure, compost and manure, and a actual processed in some way, granular version like what I showed you with miracle Grow. And just a heads up, I don't have any affiliation with miracle Grow. It's literally all that Canadian tire sells. And as I was picking it up at the store, I was like, they're gonna make fun of me. They're gonna make fun of me and they're gonna think I'm an industry plant and I swear to God, I am not, or am I? Some of this that I'm gonna give you is my opinion and then other parts of this are actually science-based. I will clarify which one is which. Sometimes I can just be neurotic because there's too much up here. I just end up doing crazy stuff because of that, this because of this, not this. Well, I mean, I do crazy stuff because of this, but this, this noggin here. So number one, containers. I did a video on how to revive your potting soil. And one of the things I said in there is I use organic material to give me more organic matter or increase the volume of the potting soil, but I don't actually use it for fertilizer. I use a slow release granular. And specifically I do use this miracle grow. Now, I don't care if it's bloom formula or the all purpose. I'll go for either one. The difference is the bloom formula has a higher, a slightly higher level of phosphorus. And that's literally it. Um, and the nitrogen is lower, which if you're doing like tomatoes and stuff may make sense for you. So definitely something to keep in mind. But I just, I follow the instructions on the back based on the container that I'm filling. And I use this in my potting soil. The reason why I put this in my potting soil comes down to the fact that this 
doesn't necessarily need microbes in excess to do a lot of the work for me and it is incredibly bioavailable right off the hop. What that means is that if my potting soil dries out, if my potting soil gets cold, if my potting soil overheats, I will still have fertilizer despite the fact that I very likely have made a massive population decrease in my microbes that usually decompose and release nutrients. So that is why I choose to use this. Now, when I apply it, like I said in that repurposing your potting soil video, I literally mix it into the entire container. Um, and I only put this in at the time in which I'm putting the potting soil into the container. If you put this in while it's in the garbage bag or in the swimming pool, you're gonna lose a lot of the fertilizer because that is one of the downfalls of synthetics is that it is very readily lost from the system depending on the nutrient that is in here. Some are more leach leachable and volatilized a little bit easier, but the only time when I don't use this and I actually only use this is when I am in my nursery pots. So right now, as things are in tiny little peat moss containers, I don't put any of the slow release granular in it. In my mind, seedlings are a little bit too fresh and new. They'd probably be just fine, but that's a neuroses right there that's kicking in for me. And so therefore I only use my liquid and I actually don't use it at full strength. I do a quarter of the strength for every time I water, I fertilize. So there's a continual source. You could do it that way, or you could do it as directed. So I think it's like once every two weeks. So set up a Saturday, every second Saturday, for example, you could go that method as well. But for me, just every single time. And the reason for that is because I always refer to soil as a soil solution. And you always want to have fertilizer readily available when you have water. And when there's no water, you don't want fertilizer available because that can burn things. <laughs> Definitely something to keep in mind. So in a garden, you have a couple different scenarios. You have the scenario in which you are transplanting plants outdoors. And then you have the scenario where you're sowing seed. Okay, so when you're transplanting outdoors, meaning you're physically taking a plant that is in seedling form or even a full blown plant and you're going to plant it into your soil if it's going to be organic and the purpose of this is to solely introduce organic material throughout the entire soil profile which will feed your organ your microorganisms which will help with actual soil structure will help with drainage will help with water retention then all you're going to do is simply literally work it into the soil either via a shovel, rototiller, or your hands. All three work. And you're just wanting to massage it in throughout the entire profile. The other option, if you are more into the no-dig world, is to do something called top dressing. Now, top dressing has some issues with it, but also has its, its own applications. So top dressing allows you to place your organic material on top of your soil surface, which helps decrease erosion and helps with moisture retention inside of your soil, which if you have a clay soil can actually help with the soil structure without even incorporating it into the soil system. What can happen though, is that you end up with a lot of nutrient loss through globalization, for example, leaching because it's not mixed in with the soil itself and mineral soil on its own has it's almost like a magnet and it kind of holds on to a lot of stuff that normally would be lost throughout the system. And in really extreme circumstances where we're talking a big thick layer of compost or manure on top of a soil surface, every single time your textures change, whether it's in a pot, so peat moss with rocks on the bottom, or it's a manure compost with a soil on the bottom, we end up with something called a perched water table. And if our roots unfortunately are hanging out in that perched water table zone and there's a too much water being supplied, we can very quickly end up with at a minimum nutrient deficiencies and in worst case scenario, root rot. Top dressing is my least favorite to do, but I do understand that some people do not like to till their soil which is totally fine. Like seriously guys, garden how you want. It really doesn't matter. And so if you're in that club and you're top dressing, it's just something to keep in mind is maybe don't do a super thick layer and do like half an inch, an inch over time and then rely on the mulch, physical mulch layer over 
a compost or a manure layer to do the work. Okay, option number three, and this is the option that you can use for manures and compost. You can also use this method for blood meals, bone meals, any sort of powder, granular, so this actual granular stuff, you would follow this rule, literally anything other than liquid. So very simply put, what you're going to do is you're going to dig your hole, depending on what depth you want to plant the seedling at. And then from there, you're going to dig a little bit lower and more out into the sides. From there, you're going to mix your soil. You're gonna mix your soil and your fertilizer together based on the recommended value. If you don't have a value, say you're using a compost or a manure, and you're not using like a blood meal or a granular or anything like that, that tells you this many teaspoons per square foot, whatever. Then what you wanna do is think about if you were to take the plant in its entirety, once it's you know fully grown up, if you were to take a tomato plant and you were to compost it, minus out all the leaves that you would add to get the composting process done, how much material would you be left with? Half a cup probably? a cup at absolute most for a giant plant, that is all you want to incorporate into the soil. Now the reason why I'm saying you need to incorporate it around the roots, but not the roots of the seedling, rather the roots of the future plant, where the future plant will reside, comes down to the fact that your rhizosphere is what is going to eventually talk to microbes and talk to the soil and where the uptake is going to be taken from. And if your plant is currently stressed out because it's been recently transplanted, maybe it's been hardening off for a while, putting fertilizer in any capacity around that root system right off the hop, it may not be used and it actually could result in fertilizer burn. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in my video where I'm gonna talk about the difference between synthetics and organics because both of them can actually burn your plant. So placing them outside of the root system, almost in a buffer zone, is going to be beneficial because it'll make the roots dig a little bit for that much needed nutrients from when that plant is a little bit larger. If you follow the instructions that are just plastered onto these containers, they'll tell you to broadcast on the soil surface and just kind of lightly you know, dig it in or kind of fluff it into the soil. Ultimately speaking, that is not, that's not where your roots are. Your roots are, don't go up, they always go down. So whenever possible, put your organic uh, materials, put your fertilizers below that root system. Okay, so that's for organics. For synthetics, you're going to follow the exact same rule. You are going to take out some soil, you're going to mix in your slow release granular, and then you're going to put the soil fertilizer mix back in on the side slash the bottom of your hole. And then if you wanted to be very careful, you could put a little buffer of potting soil or actual soil around that, and then pop your seedling into place and then put your regular soil and mulch on top. Again, this will prevent your roots and your plant from being burnt. Now, if you are going for a seed, and in this video, I'm going to use perlite as the seed because it has the greatest contrast to show you exactly what I'm talking about because every seed seems to blend in with the soil and it makes it just not fun to film. So what you want to do is there's a couple methods here. So option number one is to dig your trench double the size of what your seed depth is going to be and then putting it below your seed, meaning it's going to be accessed by the plant once the roots get into that zone, which will eventually happen. That's option number one. Now that's a little bit more labor intensive um, in my opinion, because you do have to dig to that deeper depth. Option number two, which is my favorite and actually what a lot of farmers do in you know agriculture and what we tell farmers to do in agriculture as agronomists is to it's either side band or mid row band now mid row is my preference over side banding and what you do in that case is you would have your rows of seeds so say you have two rows 
a, you know, a row of carrots and a row of radishes. Between the two rows, you're going to dig down a little bit deeper than maybe the seed or the same level of the seed. And that is where you're going to sprinkle your fertilizer in. And then you just kind of close up that gap with soil. And you can do this for organic, um, granular and organic powders, that sort of thing, and synthetics. This will allow the plant to not be overwhelmed and overrun with nutrients right off the hop and will give it time to dig for that much needed nutrients for when it's actually needed by the adult roots and not the little tiny seedling roots. Side banding is very similar to that. It's literally just putting it, you know, an inch or two away from the actual seed row in gardens in a lot of cases it just ends up being borderline a mid-row band because of just how much we cramp some of our plants together which is totally fine um, but yeah that is my personal favorite for both synthetic or organic granular methods the option if you're using a compost or a manure or something that is again going to amend the soil along with fertilize you would ideally have done what we spoke about in the beginning of the video, which is incorporating that manure, that compost into that soil profile in its entirety. And then the idea there is that you would have incorporated it to a depth that the seedling obviously is gonna have access to it, but the alternatively, the adult plant will as well because you've incorporated it into the entire soil profile in and of itself. So if you are, not sure which one to go with, if you should go with organic or you should go for synthetic, then you're probably gonna wanna check out this video right here where we talk about the difference between organic and synthetics and why a hybrid method actually probably most likely is the answer. So I'll see you over in that video. Thank you for watching. Hi, is it cuddle time? I don't remember saying it was cuddle time. I feel like it's not the cuddle times yet.